Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I am your host this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by my esteemed co host, Ricardo Martinez, uh, and a guest co host, uh, Rodrigo, who is uh, head, of, head of all things El Salvador, is the, uh, the uh, bit refills king of El Salvador, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, a fantastic man. And we've also got Jerry potentially coming on later if he sorts out his internet problems. Uh, we'll see, ever the professional uh, podcast. Um, but today, uh, most importantly, uh, we are interviewing Ricardo Frega of the Bitcoin Italia podcast, which is the uh, BIP underscore show on Twitter, if you want to check it out on Twitter. Uh, and the website is also BitcoinItaliaPodcast.it. Uh, so Ricardo, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm very good, guys. It's so nice to be here. Hello, everybody. From El Salvador, I'm Ricardo from the Bitcoin Italia podcast, currently living in El Salvador with Bitcoin only. I love it. That's a pretty important distinction to make. I'll, uh, I'll give you that. Um, so yeah, I guess like what we used to, what we try and do on the podcast, um, we have a guest on, I, I always try to start at the very beginning and then we just build from there. Um, so my question for you to begin, uh, to get us kicked off is what was life like for you before Bitcoin and how on earth did you discover Bitcoin? Oh, huge question. My, um... Bitcoin completely reshaped my life. I was at the, uh, at the time, we we're talking 2016, early 2017, I was living and working in the US um, and I knew nothing about finance, I knew nothing about economics, I knew nothing about Bitcoin. I'm, I've always been a tech geek so into computer into science and then i've been actually remember that perfectly i've been orange peeled by andreas antonopoulos um in us in one of andreas first speeches uh, in uh, in san francisco and when i've heard of this fantastic digital currency ready for the future ready for robots i don't know my mind went to the sci-fi books i loved when i was a kid you know and i said this is going to be the future i have to study massively this thing because it's going to change everything so i started be obsessed actually and then a few years later uh went back to Italy from the US and I started to check out what was going on in the Italian uh, scene and actually nothing was going on there or very little every th single content about Bitcoin was economic was financial I have always been um, an activist for human rights when I was working in the US, I was working in the cannabis, in the legal cannabis industry to legalize cannabis because I'm an anti-prohibitionist. So I work in, in the field of human rights. And so I said to myself, someone has to talk about Bitcoin as a tool to protect human rights and financial freedom here in Italy as well. So I started my podcast. There was actually the first podcast in Italian on Bitcoin. And we don't talk, we don't talk. Price does not exist on the Bitcoin Italia podcast. We don't care. We don't give financial advice. We talk about the technology and the opportunity for our society. Turned out to be pretty successful. And today is my full on full time job. So I'm blessed, guys. Are you familiar with uh, Marco Amadori's work or the Bitcoin Valley that's in uh, oh. Rovereto, Italy, I believe yeah. it's called? Yeah, yeah, Rovereto, exactly. Up in the north. Yes, of course. It, it's okay. a very nice, it's a very nice, interesting project. It's very interesting. They started actually something similar of what happened here in the Bitcoin Beach, but few years actually before the Bitcoin Beach, and um, uh, it's, as far as I know, though, something didn't work there because uh, the Bitcoin Valley is still on. You can still go in that specific place, Rovereto, and buy things with Bitcoin. Uh, but somehow the technology didn't spread out. 
So it's there and it's staying there. Um, Italy is a very different country, is a full on uh, uh, first world country. We have euros, we have an economic and financial uh, system that quote works. And we can discuss what these works mean, but uh, we don't have, we don't feel the need of Bitcoin in Italy at the moment. We, are, we have a decent amount of freedom and a decent amount of economic independence. So Rovereto stayed a very nice experiment that never really catch, never really gained the momentum. Yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense, though, uh, because obviously, as you said, it, uh, I mean, I've only been to Italy once, but um, from what I can see, it's similar in ways to other European countries like Spain and the UK and Portugal, these places that have a fairly, you know, somewhat robust financial system and system and yeah, somewhat fairly good freedoms, obviously you know covid's kind of changed a lot of the freedom aspect but uh but but before that uh, everything was generally okay enough and you know so it doesn't actually incentivize people enough to make a big change in their life um a lot of the time and that, that's kind of what i find in the uk is that people are interested in bitcoin and crypto in general for making money but um there's not enough of an incentive to make them go oh, okay actually i need to change and things need to really change and obviously that may come about sometime in the, in the future and i think it will but I can see it's going to happen. It's going to happen for sure. We use this thing differently. I mean, I'm, I work with countries like El Salvador, like Nigeria, like Afghanistan, like Russia. They have a real use case. They are using Bitcoin to protect themselves from a dictator, from an authoritarian government, from hyperinflation here, not far from here in Venezuela. We don't have those problems yet in Italy and in the European Union. So what Bitcoiners think about the cryptocurrency in my country is uh, I have to huddle. I get, I get uh, a text from people, from fans uh, in Italy, uh, while I've been living this uh, Salvadorian adventure and they text me, they write me on Instagram, on Twitter, why the hell are you spending your Satoshis in El Salvador while you could just hodl and they're gonna get, and their, and their value is gonna increase in time. So there is this obsession. I never got this. I can spend Bitcoin now and buy them back tomorrow. So why should I be obsessed in holding them uh, like, I don't know, uh, Uncle Scrooge? Spend your Bitcoins, friend. They are made to be spent. Yeah, I, 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 I personally agree with you as well. Uh, and I kind of never really saw a problem with spending Bitcoin. I must have spent well over a whole Bitcoin in my life, uh, at least. Uh, yeah, at least. But um. I think uh, I think a lot of the perspective comes from the um, there's a key difference in people who, who who look at Bitcoin as possibly being like the future of finance and actually being utilized for payments, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's people who are just seeing Bitcoin as like, yeah, OK, this is probably something that's going to stick around for quite a while and probably is going to make me money. So I'll just invest in that to then sell it at a later date. Right. Um, and that's the big key, because if everyone just hodled it, nothing's going to happen. No one's ever going to use it. And it's just kind of going to go up and then eventually probably go down in value once everyone realizes that no one's doing anything with it so um yeah this is it has to have people like yourself and and others spending it uh to give the hodlers actual actually some value it is, that's my opinion on it anyway so absolutely if nobody spends bitcoin who's gonna pay for rodrigo at bitrefill <laughs> there you go right there you go right <laughs> right uh, so I was, uh, Ricardo, I was seeing your po your podcast that you have on YouTube that you have do done in El Salvador. Uh, I saw both of them. One when you went up to the to the volcano mining, which was fantastic. And also the one I wanted to talk about. Well, I will talk about both, but I wanted to have, I, I wanted to compliment you on, you know, it's a 10 minute piece about why Bitcoin in El Salvador and maybe six or seven minutes of those are devoted to one of the greatest tragedies that El Salvador has experienced, which was the massacre of 
El Mosote. And I understand now that you're, when you're talking about your background and human rights, etc., that that's how, you know, uh, you don't kind of get it why you do that in the beginning, but then you just close it up, quoting a maxi capitalist like uh, Henry Ford, saying that, you know, if you stop the money, then you stop the wars, which is a fantastic way, because uh, as you say, why is why has El Salvador has had a sort of trade history? And you say because because it has it has been poor, etc. So on that, uh, as, did you visit any other? Because now I know that you've been to Morazan, where El Mosote is. I know that you've been to Santa Ana. I know that you've been to La Libertad for sure. I know when we met, we met here in San Salvador. And um, so these are four of 14 different departments here, they are called. Have you had the chance to visit them all? Or, and what do you, how do you think they are in terms of readiness? How is the Bitcoin law being or, or ac adopted here in El Salvador, Bitcoin in general? What is your experience? It's a huge question, but you know, we have time, I guess. I'll try. I, I do my best, Rodrigo. Um... Yeah, first of all, let me say that the YouTube video that you're talking about, about the civil war in El Salvador, was very important for me to make. And even if it's not specifically Bitcoin related, it is. Because, you know, I come from Italy. We all come, most of us come from lucky country, first world country. And we tend not to care why there are so many poor and endangered countries in the world, right? We forget about their history, but our history is what made us today and we are privileged we i, I never I, I never did nothing to deserve being born in a first world country and in a peaceful moment for my country so in my work it's always very important to remind people that we are just one mankind that we share one word and that we live in different environment and nobody has to be blamed for the country he's born into so uh, why El salvador which is a beautiful land so pristine there's water here there's agriculture there's everything you know uh, that a country need to provide for its people because this country has been used and abused systematically by colonialism uh, by the spain empire first and then by the us uh, secondly, and then horrendously hit by a bloody civil war and by corruption. So there is a reason why El Salvador needs Bitcoin. It's not that the Salvadorian people, they don't want to work on, or they don't want to be better or they don't want to be richer. They can't because they got stuck in an economical politi political system that, is a, that, it, that has been a downward spiral for them. Bitcoin is the thing that can stop that spiral if we inject in if we inject it in the system in the right way. Uh, I spent five, almost five weeks in this country. I toured them I, I toured it basically all i've been also in uh, suchitoto i've been in the south i've been in la union i've been in the southern beaches of la cuco so i, I think i have a, a very a, a complete view on what's going on in the country. I made a living here in El Salvador using Bitcoin only for five weeks. I never touched a dollar or a credit card. So it is possible, it is already possible. And this is great, guys. It's something we shouldn't overlook. What I did here for five weeks was unthinkable one year ago. And we have to thank uh, the Bitcoin law for it, because everyone in this country now, not everyone, 2.5 million Salvadorian, they have a, a Bitcoin wallet, some kind of something that looks like a Bitcoin wallet, that it's the Chivo app, and that uh, is a way you can pay them in Bitcoin. That's what I did. And... Um, at the same time, what I found out 
touring the country is a huge lack of education. And this is something that it has to be addressed. Um, millions of Salvadorians, they got rushed into the Bitcoin law without knowing what Bitcoin is. Nobody told them. They have been given a, a, an application, a Chivo, that it's a custodial application and that has so many problems and nobody told them how to use it. Um, what is financial freedom? Nobody told them that there are other wallets available that they could use and they could benefit from. Uh, they don't know the difference from a lightning transaction to an on-chain transaction. They don't know the basic of Bitcoins. And I think this was a, was a mistake by President Bukele because if you, uh, it's not about giving people Bitcoin and a wallet, it's about giving people education uh, and, and knowledge in order for them to use this tool and make their life better. Um, the Northern, and maybe later we can talk a little bit more in details of this if you guys like. But to end your question, Rodrigo, um, of course, San Salvador, the capital of the city, is a very Bitcoin friendly city. Of course, the beach, uh, the Bitcoin beach where I'm cur currently, it's super Bitcoin friendly. The north of the country was very Bitcoin friendly. Uh, Santana, for example, the southern, uh, not so much. Um, for what I understand, it's more it's it's more poor. This is the southern part of the country. There is more uh, immigration, emigration from that part of the country. So there are actually a lot of remittance on the Chivo wallet, but people exchange them in dollars straight away. They don't really use the Chivo hub that much to to pay, and. Um, um, of course, when you get completely outside the touristic routes, it gets more difficult. It gets more complicated because that, that's the thing, you know, this is a very uh, cash oriented society. Everyone in El Salvador use cash, piles and piles of dirty dollars. So uh, when, they, when they deal with other Salvadorians, their technology to go is cash. There is the incentive though, if they work with tourists, if they work with people that is actually asking them to buy in Bitcoin, then something is gonna happen in their mind, you know? And they are gonna tell each other, that's an opportunity we shouldn't miss and they download the app and they are open to use it. And when you show them how to properly use it with a wallet that is not Chivo, they thank you. They are thankful because nobody told them that. So I've been educating a lot of Salvadorian dur during the, this month and a half. And once again, the driver is the incentive that's why it's important for you guys that are, that are listening to this podcast. Come to El Salvador, spend your Bitcoin in El Salvador, pretend to use Bitcoins in El Salvador. Don't give up. Don't use dollars here. I know you mentioned that Chivo has uh, problems and I've heard that it has like liquidity issues and, and stuff as well. Um, does the average Salvadorian, are they aware of the Bitcoin Beach wallet? And do they see it as like an alternative, like a, maybe a more positive alternative to Chiba? No, most of them, they don't know, unfortunately. Uh, most of them, that's my opinion, um, heard the word Bitcoin when the Chivo app was launched. So they have zero clue that there are other wallets, uh, not only the Bitcoin Beach wallet, 
other wallets. Um, for them, Chivo is the digital app to make payments. And that's important because uh, for what, from what I've learned, they basically use Chivo as we use PayPal or just another digital system. They are not even that much aware they can pay dollars in dollars and in Bitcoin via the app, you know? When I tell them, listen, uh, because doing what they do, I have to ask first. So when I have to find a, a, a hotel, I have to call them all just to ask them in advance if they accept Bitcoin because I want to pay in Bitcoin. Or when I enter a restaurant, first question is, hola chicos, acceptan Bitcoin? And then they answer and they tell me, yes, we do, no, we don't. So when you, get, when you get to pay, what they do is showing you a QR code to pay with dollars, because that's what they do between Salvadorians. They use the Chivo app to exchange dollars. They, they don't even know there is another QR code in there that it's the Bitcoin QR code. And they absolutely have no idea you can generate a lightning network uh, invoice because they have no clue of, of, of Bitcoin. <laughs> Nobody knows what the, what the lightning network is. So uh, really there is a total lack of education. And the Bitcoin Beach um, wallet is very popular here in this area. A couple of times I, um, I've seen it used outside the area, um, but to be honest with you, uh, I, 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 I'm a big fan of the Bitcoin Beach experiment. For sure it was important for El Zonte. They made something super special in here and it, they're still doing it. But I don't know, man, sometimes uh, I wonder why the Bitcoin Beach wallet has to be another custodial, uh, 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 custodial wallet. You know, they have this uh, weird, they call it community custodial, but all in all, you know, the Bitcoin Beach wallet doesn't give you your uh, private keys. And to me, I might be old school, but that's the whole point of having Bitcoin, owning your private keys so um and there is this attitude you know also here at the bitcoin beach salvadorians are not ready to hold properly on their keys why because they're dumb they, they live in a cash society so everyone that lives in uh, el salvador has a hall where they hide 100 bucks 150 bucks so are you trying to tell me they're not going to be able to hide and hold on a little bit of piece of paper with 12 or 24 words uh, on it i don't believe that so there is this approach of that wallet that I don't really like. And even here in the Bitcoin Beach, I find that there is a huge lack of education. Um, and the Bitcoin Beach has been working for three, for three years, properly economically funded in this area. And it's a very small community. It's 3,000 people. So what happened? Some, something, something was wrong here. If you travel to El Tunco, which is basically the beach beside, nobody accepts Bitcoin there. Nobody. I mean, maybe three shops in town. So it's slow, guys. I know we want this thing to happen tomorrow, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take years in El Salvador as well. Something that's kind of interesting to me, actually, that you mentioned in the very beginning, um, and it kind of ties into a lot of what you're mentioning now, from what I can see, uh, would be that you you said, obviously, that you, and, I, and I looked this up anyway beforehand, I was, I was stalking you before the podcast um, to find out more information I could ask you about. And uh, it, obviously, you said you worked in the medical marijuana field. Um, sure, 
I'm making the assumption here that surely there's quite a lot of comparisons between the two fields when you're working in it, right? Like I, I was going to ask you like how, because obviously you're saying there's obviously a problem with the education and people not being aware of things and, and like how, you know, different certain words like lightning or how to use it. Surely this is somewhat similar to the fight of medical marijuana, right? Like people not being aware of the actual health risks or benefits and all these things yeah i guess like are there any kind of other similarities that you can see or, or like very stark differences and that you've experienced in in working in both of the medical marijuana and the um uh cryptocurrency bitcoin sphere oh yeah so many um first of all lawrence let me point this out not only medical marijuana specifically recreational because the field i work uh is total anti-prohibitionism, all drugs should be legalized and regulated, cocaine and heroin first. This is obviously my opinion and my field. So there are so many similarities. I actually have uh, two podcasts in Italy, my main one, that it's the Bitcoin Ital Italia podcast, but I have a podcast on drugs as well. We do harm reduction and we teach people how to take drugs, minim minimizing the risks in their consumption while they use because nobody tell them. So once again, there is a big lack of education. And the main similarity I find, and the reason why I'm doing these things both, and there is a fine line between them, is that we are talking about freedom and independence, you know? It should be a choice, everything, on this world should be a free choice, especially when what I am choosing doesn't harm anyone else on this planet. If I choose to consume, to smoke pot, I'm not making anything worse than when I choose freely and I'm allowed to do that, to have a beer or to have a vodka tonic. It's my choice, it's my free choice. Bitcoin is, a, is, is the free choice to opt out from the traditional economic system. And this should be a human right. I should be able to decide for myself what system I use to store and exchange my value. So it's a matter of freedom, freedom of choice. I had a follow-up question to Lawrence's question. It's a two-part question. Did you encounter um, cannabis businesses in the US like not having access to financial infrastructure. Um, I know there's been like uh, in states like Colorado where they legalized marijuana, um, the businesses were denied banking services and some of them have actually implemented Bitcoin as a solution. And then also is what's Italy's attitude towards drug prohibition? I know in Portugal and Holland and other countries in Europe, there's kind of been this decriminalization and regulation. Is Italy like that or is it still kind of like dark ages prohibition? Um, um, I worked in the cannabis industry um, 2013, 14, 15, 16. So it's been a while now that I'm not in the US anymore. And I was working specifically in Oregon and Southern Oregon. Um, and uh, uh, to be honest with you, uh, Oregon has a huge tradition with, with cannabis. Actually, they, they were the first US state to have a medical marijuana program. So uh, back in the days, uh, it was already a very established business with the proper dispensaries and everything. And I've never heard of uh, uh, people having uh, uh, problems with banks, uh, having uh, financial aid to start their business. But as you mentioned, I know in Colorado it happened. And I know there are several cryptocurrencies coin, canna coin that are supposed to be made to, um, to help who want to start a cannabis related business to get money. I'm not really a big 
altcoin fan to be honest with you so i'm not uh, i don't think that that's the right approach um italy's dark age prohibition at the moment um and that's a big huge issue finally thank god we've been we've been working hard last year to to collect 500,000 uh, citizen signature, we're going to vote, we're going to have people vote on a project to uh, decriminalize uh, uh, possession of marijuana and also personal use. I don't know how it's going to go. I'm going to tell you guys uh, at the end of the spring because Italy is also a very conservative country as as all Europe actually is. Um, Germany is about to work on a law that is going to legalize marijuana. So the wind is kind of changing in the old Europe too. I'm very positive. It's going to take us probably years, um, but it's going to happen. At the moment, though, um marijuana possess and consumption in Italy is strictly strictly illegal prohibited and that's actually the main reason why our jails are packed with people 70 percent of uh, who's in jail in Italy is in jail for small non-violent pot related crimes and that's idiotic I, I completely uh, understand your point of view there. Seventy uh, percent seems like a pretty large uh, number. I mean, I guess um, I'm not going to drag too far from the, uh, the topic, but I uh, what you said earlier about uh, education, and again, this was obviously regarding marijuana, drugs, Bitcoin, etc. But um, there's, cl- there's clearly this lack of education in El Salvador, which is uh, on Bitcoin. Sorry, I should say, which is understandable because it the law is. I mean when we talk about global politics and laws and it's very, 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 very new. Um, and before that, not really a huge effort was put in to actually educate people. It was more just a Bitcoin beach project, a few community projects, and then just boof, this law appears. Um, so there's obviously this issue there. I suppose uh, in in Italy, I'm interested because I don't know a huge amount about the Bitcoin scene in Italy, um, probably less than, than El Salvador, since I at least visited El Salvador as someone who's you know interested in, in Bitcoin. Um, in Italy, what's the, what's the resources like? Because obviously you've got your podcast. I'm sure some other podcasts have popped up. Um, I'm sure there's a YouTuber or something, but what, what is it like when it comes to content like books and translations into Italian and websites and things like that? How far along is that when it comes to sort of educating people speaking the Italian language on, on Bitcoin? Oh, there's a lot of stuff at the moment. Thank God the situation changed a lot in the past four years. Of course, we have all the classic books available in Italian as well. Bitcoin Standard, uh, the Internet of Money, uh, those Bibles (laughs) are available in Italian all over the place. And there is a pretty active scene uh, a lot of YouTube uh, po- uh, influencer, uh, some good podcast, uh, um, a lot of small business, uh, local exchanges are working as well. Unfortunately, uh, most of the contents you can find in Italian are uh, investment related. I'm going to make you rich by Shiba Inu, by whatever you call it. I don't want to even mention those. And that's the approach. That's the pop approach. And I think it's kind of the same everywhere in the first world. You know, we are into Bitcoin as an asset. Uh, As I said, To me, there's so much more in there. So I try to do things differently and to bring on the table a different perspective and a different approach to this technology. I'm mainly the only one that that, uh, is doing it. 
Um, there are some very good uh, um, technical expert. Uh, first of all, my good friend Giacomo Zucco, that is probably the only Italian superstar in uh, in the Bitcoin community, and that that is pretty much all. There is a lot of guys that are making shitload of views with videos on what you should buy uh, to get rich quick, which is not really something I like, but that's freedom. You know, Satoshi Nakamoto gave us this tool and it comes with no instructions. So everyone is free to use it the way he likes it and the way he loves it. That's fair enough. And I, I think also the, the other thing to consider that's a positive is that often when people discover these, I, I think a lot of people do get into Bitcoin and, and, and things like that from actually like, oh, I want to make some money. And then it the, then cascades into it once you find out more about it and you understand it. So there's always that positive that that content does lead people down the right path as well sometimes. Um, it's, the, it's the case for me. I mean, I, I only cared about the money for in 2018. And then uh, obviously, you know, it goes from there. Uh, if, if you're talking to someone who's like new to what is your like the the, the one resource you're going to send someone to like a book or whatever i guess I, i'll caveat by saying other than your podcast because um, <laughs> i know that would be the answer but other than that what would be your like you know if it's like oh you got to read this book or you got to watch this specific video or whatever like what would it be that you would direct people towards um Bitcoin, Bitcoin standard uh, uh, is a must, is a, absolutely a must uh, read. Personally, I named the guy already. I have a crush and I still have a crush after so many years for Andreas Antonopoulos. To me, he is a Jedi master, really, because he has this human approach and he's super good in the way he speak and because you know bitcoin what i what i still find fascinating after so many years is that uh, bitcoin is something that has truly multiple faces is something so complex that you can you can effectively talk about bitcoin on several different perspectives you know i like what andreas uh, did with me he gave me the technological approach the sci-fi book approach the trust net approach bitcoin is much more than an economical system is a trust net we are gonna be able to write on the blockchain all uh, uh, information that at the moment need a third party to be trusted that's gonna change everything so i love that approach to me is a is a absolute god and i am so sad that some of the toxic bitcoiner are recently attacking him uh, because he wrote mastering ethereum as well and so someone calls andreas uh, a shitcoiner because of that you have to deal with me first before you touch my master uh, so, so i think i think uh, yeah uh, anyone attacking andreas like uh, honestly just do one as far as i'm concerned i mean i, uh, I it's, it's funny that you mentioned that as well because the two the only two bitcoin books i have a hard copy of and i don't just have like a pdf or audio book or whatever are uh, mastering bitcoin by andreas and then bitcoin standard by safety and so the two things that actually pretty much you've just mentioned um did you see uh safety uh on jordan peterson's podcast uh it was uh, maybe a month, two months ago, a month ago or so. I can't remember now, but um, I think uh, the ability that he had to kind of find what uh, Jordan Peterson's uh, in or interest or whatever was, and then say, oh, this is how, you know, Bitcoin, I guess, fixes that was really interesting because um, it plays to how everyone, when you're kind of trying to orange pill someone has a different thing they care about in their heart or there's a value of theirs, whether it's making money or being free or transferring energy or being environmentally friendly and then you can play to that right um so i found that really interesting if you think about it orange peeling someone it's all about finding the g spot it's like having sex with a new girl you know you have to learn what she likes where she wants to be touched and once that you learn that that's when the orgasm can 
And you have to do the same with Bitcoin. If you talk to me about uh, investment, I'm going to be bored. I'm going to cheat on you on the second day. If you talk to me about the future of this society, about financial freedom, about human rights, I'm going to probably squirt. Can we say that word in the BitRefill uh, podcast? Yeah, it's all good. He's given us a fantastic uh, clip to extract from this podcast. <laughs> this is just <laughs> perfect. I love it. Yeah, yeah it's all the, good. the Italian take on Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> it represents uh, everything perfectly, uh, I think. But, uh, it's, 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 it's amazing to see the... Because you can see you're in America, back to Italy, to El Salvador... Uh, you've been working in marijuana, make marijuana, Bitcoin. There's a, there's a lot that you've done in the past, probably, I'm guessing, only for eight, what, four or five years, maybe? If you, I mean, maybe slightly longer, but uh, it's been a, a wild journey. I guess, like, what in your mind, uh, it sounds like you're living somewhat in the moment, which is what I like to do as well, but what is your kind of plan moving forward, I guess, like for the podcast, but also for, 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 for you, for Ricardo's life? Um, I'm so blessed. Um, I always wanted my life to be an adventure and so far has been just fantastic and uh, I owe Bitcoin a lot because he uh, Bitcoin gave me the opportunity to change my life once again for the good so I don't know how nobody knows what's gonna happen with it I don't know if this revolution is gonna be successful to me it's already successful because I'm doing what I love. I'm creating content, content that I blindly believe into. And I'm, I mean, guys, let's face it. This is for the history books. We all are going to be truly in the history book in a hundred years. Kids at school, they're going to they're going to study about the early days of Bitcoin, you know, and those guys are us. We are those guys, you know, it's like when you read uh, now who started the French Revolution and you stop thinking uh, what would have been back in those days. They're going to ask the same thing about who started the Bitcoin Revolution and it's us. It's literally us, and this is already something huge. I feel so blessed every day in my life. Um, there is so much still to be done, and so I'm looking forward to keep doing what I am doing for people in Italy, to keep uh, touring the world, to find out real use case, uh, because that's what I want to see, you know? I would love to spend time in Africa, I would love to go to Vietnam, I would love to go to India to understand what is happening here, because guys, let's face it, we need more and better journalism most of the people the so-called pro journalists in italy they write articles on facebook reading facebook pages it's time to get our our hands dirty and to go back in the fields and to see by yourself and to witness and to experience that's why i wanted to live in a in el salvador for a month and a half using bitcoin only not because i'm crazy because it's a it's a it's a it, it, it's a game it's a game to tell something you know it's a game to, it's a way to tell a story that it's going to be interesting and that it's going to be catchy for people in italy to read so um i'm going to keep doing this as much as i can and um and hopefully uh, doing my best. <laughs> um, and then hopefully maybe I'm gonna write something in English as well. My blog uh, on the website, uh, um, Bitcoin Italia, bip.show as well. That's easier to remember. Um, it's in Italian and in English. And I had so many positive feedbacks uh, uh, from my international friends. So I would love like to explore more uh, on that and we're going to see each other at the Bitcoin conference in Miami in April and I want to come back to El Salvador to see what's going on and there 
there's plenty to do, guys. We are legion. We have a lot to do. Yes, yeah, what you said about uh, journalism is interesting as well, because you can see from uh, even like if uh, you look at Joe Rogan's latest uh, podcast ratings, it's like 12 million or just shy or just over 12 million people on one of the latest episodes. And then you compare that to like, all of these other like, uh, not like yeah, CNBC and all these other people's ratings that are all just completely like the traditional journalists ratings and shows that are on TV ratings are just so much lower. Uh, and it goes to show the broad appeal globally that, that, that someone can have, but also the, I guess the, the dying sort of uh, belief in large journalist uh, companies. And, and, and it feels like independent people, uh, are doing better because they kind of have to have credibility or else if they don't they don't have anything they're not getting paid anywhere else so that's interesting. because because guys we have freedom and they don't anymore i mean i can't talk for the rest of the world but in italy actually there is a there is a non-profit organization is a french one that is called uh, reporters with no borders and every year every year they compile um, uh, they value country by country for freedom of speech and freedom of journalism all over the world, all over the world. And Italy, oh boy, Italy ranks pretty low, pretty low, like a North African country. Because, uh, you know, being a journalist today means being a tool. Because nobody reads books anymore. Nobody re reads newspaper anymore. Newspapers and real journalists are basically in the hand of the advertisers because it's advertising that is paying for their salary and for their uh, newspapers. And of course, there is political power, which is basically what they work for. Because if you if you wanna if you wanna have a successful party in a first world country, you need to have the news on your side. So that happened in America, happened in Italy with Berlusconi. Who doesn't know Berlusconi? Uh, the proto-Trump. So uh, it's it's hard to be a mainstream journalist as well today. That's where we come handy because we have no masters because we have no uh, because I run no advert I I run no ads in my show I am here paid by the support of my community and pay and paid uh, with uh, money of people that believes in what I'm doing that wants from me to have quality contents. And that's, I mean, that, that's something that has no price because it gives me freedom. It's all about freedom, guys. Bitcoin is about freedom. We are all about freedom because someone has to stand for it. No, I like that approach. Uh, I really like that approach. Uh, I mean, I guess, um, I don't know if the other guys have any more questions, but we're running on for about an hour. Um, well, not far off it, I suppose. Um, so I don't know. Is there, is there anything else anyone, well, anyone wanted to ask? Yeah, I I was uh, going back to the to the podcast that you had uh, about the visit that you did to Berlin, where the geothermal uh, mining is being done, and you said something interesting there. You said that you said two things that were interesting because it kind of it kind of shows the contradictions here in El Salvador. You said that you know it's a third world country, but it's the first country in the world that is mining bitcoins, and you also said uh, that. Uh, it was the most high. It was one of the most high-level technological places in the world. And now that you you mentioned that you come from a tech background and you always be interested about technology, that is actually amazing. And as I said, you know, this is as you've seen now during these five weeks that you've been here. This is a country of contrasts, and I think you have captured that perfectly. Uh, there is no real question, just comment on that. But I have another question, and that is, why do you have a Sputnik? Uh, satellite as your logo. <laughs> I, I live in Russia, so I'm, I'm kind of, you know, uh, you know turned. <laughs> because we are going to the moon 
And in Italy, we were the first one. And the Sputnik, like it or not, was the first one. So uh, I loved to use that little icon to, to, to be the logo of my show. Because we are going to the moon, guys. Never forget that. Um, uh, the geothermal plant of Berlin, uh, Rodrigo, was one of the best days of my life. Uh, my the the real geek in me was, I mean, I had a, I had a boner all visit long. It was so cool, guys. It's totally reusable energy, hundred percent green, condensed condensed in absolute digital scarcity by a government by a state. For the first time, this is gonna be this is gonna be groundbreaking. This is gonna change everything. And uh, there is one thing that I want to tell you guys, and that I don't say in the in the video. I was very uh, eager during the visit to speak with the guys that were working at the facility, right? The technicians, to understand if what they really think of Bitcoin because those are scientists and they make energy. That's what they do. They've been trained to make green energy. So I was interesting, uh, I, I, um, I mean, it was interesting to understand what they think of Bitcoin, if they see it as a waste of energy or, or if they get it, if they agree with the um, with the uh, uh, approach that that Bitcoin is condensed energy, that is a mathematical battery, you know. And uh, I was blown away by the fact that they totally did. They said, "No, listen, this is gonna change the way we manage." Electri electricity consumption and storage for the next hundred year. This is fantastic. This is a groundbreaking. Thanks to Bitcoin, we're going to be able to radically change the electric grid. Uh, we're going to be able to harvest uh, electricity in places like in the desert, where before Bitcoin, it was absolutely technologically impossible to harvest. This is good for mankind, according to the Kardashev law, you know? So this is going to make us a better society, a better species. And this guy is someone that makes electricity to live. So the whole Bitcoin uh, is responsible for the global warming narrative. God, that's so dumb that every time I hear that, it, it makes me cry. I think it's uh, that's just a that's just a sort of uh, part of the media narrative and, and and lack of education on Bitcoin, I suppose, isn't it? Globally, really. Um, I mean, it speaks volumes the fact that my mum, within about three minutes, could work out that it was BS. Um, it's pretty, <laughs> speaks, speaks volumes as far as I'm concerned. It's people who really harp it on, it's like, really? Come on. Um, they really believe that, but there you go. Um, no, I do it. It's been, um, been wonderful to have you on the podcast it's uh, much appreciated on my part and uh i uh, yeah i appreciate your passion for for bitcoin and uh lots more in el salvador and i can see you probably well potentially uh going to any of the other countries that legalize bitcoin this coming year which fingers crossed should happen um and yeah i mean i'll go uh, for anyone who is obviously uh listening uh, as we said at the beginning uh bitcoin italia podcast is ricardo's podcast bip underscore show on twitter or bip dot show uh on the uh, the world wide web um but yeah ricardo is there anything you wanted to to, to say before you uh, before we head off let's do it again friends Absolutely. I uh, completely agree. Yeah, we'll be happy to have you back. Uh, we've started having a few people back for, for second podcasts because uh, we just love, love chanting them. So we'll be happy to have you back in the future. Um, but yeah, it's been amazing. And I, I say I'm interested to see uh, your journey um, as you uh, kind of what happens next, basically, in the, in the life of Ricardo. So I appreciate you coming on. And uh, for everyone out there listening, uh, have an amazing uh, day, week, year, month. Um, and thanks so much, Rodrigo and Ricardo, for joining me. Uh, and hey guys, thank uh, you so much. 
take care everyone out there uh have a great time and uh keep on buying some bitcoin